Now, today we are launching a brand new series called The Good Fight. It's going to go for uh, probably four weeks, maybe three, could be five. Uh, and I'm going to be teaching this uh, series, probably the whole thing, actually. And it really points to the idea that as followers of Jesus, we're in a battle. God calls us to fight for some stuff that really matters. And so we're going to look at what those things are and equip ourselves with some tools and some practices and some resources that are gonna help see us fight the good fight. Well, hey there, Elevate friends and family. Great to have you with us today. Now, when it comes to music, have you noticed that the subject of the heart is a big, big topic? I mean, for the sake of this message, I asked the internet to Give me a list of the top 100 songs with the word heart just in the title. And uh, I don't have time to go through all 100. You can find that listicle for yourself. But here's the top three. I wonder if you recognize any of these. At number three, Blondie's Heart of Glass. Yeah, that uh, takes you back a ways, as does number two, Owner of a Lonely Heart by British band Yes. And then at number one, this listicle put Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart, which, by the way, has one of the greatest lyrics in the song that I think's ever been written. Once upon a time, I was falling in love. Now, I'm only falling apart. <laughs> they don't write them like they used to, friends. Uh, anyway, but sitting just outside the top three, was number seven, rock set, listen to your heart. Now, question, have you ever given or received advice kind of packaged like that? Listen to your heart. You know, do what your heart's telling you to do. On the surface, this may come across as good advice calls into question why the prophet Jeremiah several thousand years ago said that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. I mean, who can understand it? So why would you listen to your heart if your heart is deceitful above all things? Uh, stick a pin in that. I'm going to come back to this. But today, as we've been talking already, we're launching a brand new series called The Good Fight. And uh, one of the great misconceptions and one of the biggest mistakes we can make is thinking that when we make the decision to follow Jesus, that there'll be no more struggles, that all of our battles are behind us, because this mistake leads to an even greater mistake which is to let our guard down. I mean, if we don't need to fight, we don't need to keep our guard up. It turns out, as Jesus followers, we are actually called to fight because we're actually in a battle. And we're going to talk about that in this series. Before we do and before we dive into today's uh, particular topic, uh, let me just qualify, there's some things as followers of Jesus that we don't need to fight for. We don't need to fight for God's forgiveness. It's offered to us as a free gift and we simply need to accept it. Speaking of acceptance, we don't need to fight for God's acceptance. We simply accept it as a free gift from Him. But there are some things that as Jesus followers we're called to fight for. And that's what this series is all about. And we're going to spend a few weeks drilling into some of the things that we're called to fight for. And the title of this series, The Good Fight, is taken from something that Paul wrote to his mentee, Timothy. Now, Paul was a big leader in the early church and uh, he'd raised Timothy up under his leadership. And turn eventually wrote a couple of letters to Timothy. And this is the second one that Paul wrote, which towards the end of this letter, Paul included this statement. I've fought 
the good fight. I've finished the race and I have remained faithful. Now, you can kind of picture the tone and it wouldn't surprise you to learn that this letter is considered probably Paul's last written words on this planet. And he's talked about the reality that he's fought the good fight because Paul, when you start to study out his life and his ministry, you come to discover that from the time that he became a Jesus follower, he faced battle after battle, after battle, after battle. Things that when you and I might read them, we'd think, boy, that's a reason enough to quit. Um, that's a pretty big deal, you know, to, or just to pull back. Like, don't be so full on, Paul. Uh, or, or just like, well, you, you have a choice, Paul. You can take the, 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 the easy option of comfort and convenience, but Paul didn't do any of those things. And so here he is at the end of his life or nearing the end of his life, writing, declaring, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've remained faithful. And, and Paul wrote this letter from a Roman prison, which whilst it wasn't the first time he found himself in a Roman prison, it was the last time in church history kind of, points to the, the, the notion that Paul likely might have gotten out of prison for a short time, but soon after this writing of this particular letter, he was put to death by the sword. And so he knew, potentially knew that death was near. But what an incredible declaration to be able to make when you're nearing the end of your life. I fought the good fight. You, you know, it, it's a good fight. It's a worthwhile fight, but it's a fight nonetheless. And I can tell you right now, I want to be able to make that declaration. And I hope you desire that for your life as well. I've fought the good fight. I've done what Jesus called me to do to the best of my abilities. I didn't take the convenient option. I didn't back off. And I didn't quit even when things got hard. So today in the first week of this series, I want to talk about what it means to fight for your heart. So if you've got your smartphone, just scan this flow code. It's going to take you to Proverbs. Specifically, it's going to take you to Proverbs chapter 4. And while you're doing that, let me give you some context. Uh, this uh, what we kind of call a book of Proverbs, was it's actually a collection of wise sayings written by Solomon, who's considered the wisest person that ever lived, apart from Jesus. Um, and uh, just a collection of incredible wise sayings, timeless wisdom to live by. And in chapter 4, verse 23, Solomon makes this incredible point, and point of instruction, by the way, when he writes, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Above your possessions, above your ambitions. In fact, he, just, he didn't even list the things out. He just said, above all else, everything. Guard your heart. So, Let's go back to Roxette's advice. Listen to your heart. Is this good advice or not? Well, I'm going to say uh, it depends. It depends on the condition of your heart. It depends on the priorities of your heart. It depends on the direction that your heart's pointing towards. And see, according to Solomon, your heart determines <coughs> the course of your life. So whether or not we should listen to our heart really comes down to the big question, well, what's the condition of your heart? And therefore, where is it leading you? Because if, le <laughs> if the condition of your heart is not good, it's likely going to be leading you off track. So listening to it will be a very, very, very bad idea. But Solomon 
kind of issued a counterpoint, like a warning, like a safeguard. Guard your heart so that it doesn't drift. So don't leave it unprotected so that it doesn't get damaged. And when it does, make it a priority to do the necessary running repairs. So I just want to list off three very accessible practices that you and I can put into practice in our lives that will help to guard our heart. And the first one is this, forgiveness. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I taught a, a message that Jesus wants you to experience his promises. It was the final week of a series we called, But You Promised. And in this message, I asked the question, is there anything that Jesus has called you to do or instructed you to do that you haven't done yet? And full disclosure, I'd gotten so kind of wrapped up in preparing the message and then preaching the message and that I kind of forgot to ask myself that question. Is there anything that Jesus has instructed me to do that I haven't done yet? And so the day after I'd finished preaching this message, I was preparing our Elevate group notes and I was like, bing, light bulb went on. And I realized, actually, I haven't asked myself that question. Is there anything, Mark, that Jesus has called you to do that you haven't done yet? And I very quickly landed on forgiveness. That I had a list of people who had been bad actors towards me in my life in the past <laughs> that I hadn't got around to forgiving yet. So I started to make the list. And I went back through a couple of decades. Pretty decent list of bad actors. And sadly, most of them are Christians, uh, which is where a meme like this kind of rears its head. So having made the list, I started the process of forgiving them. And... It started slowly. It didn't start with God bless them. It started with uh, God, don't let them have a stroke. Um, but I, I, I just, I went on that process. I started literally name by name, working through that list and, and forgiving them. And as I continued that journey, I found my joy level rising. I found my peace level rising and I found myself more excited and focused on the future than I was when I was tethered to some of what the bad actors had done in the past. And one of the important things to understand about forgiveness is that it isn't even about the bad actors. See, good chance that, you know, they haven't asked for it, sent you a message, phoned you up, I'm really sorry, can you forgive me for what I did? Many cases that maybe don't even deserve your forgiveness, but here's the thing, forgive anyway, because unforgiveness weighs you down. Unforgiveness holds you back. Unforgiveness corrodes your heart. And one of the safeguards to guarding our heart is to fight the good fight and forgive regularly. And I use that word regularly, very, very intentionally. Because, you know, whilst forgiveness occasionally can act like a whiteboard, you know, where you might write the list of the bad actor or the bad actors, and then you just wipe the name off, I forgive them, next one I forgive them, next one I forgive them, and it's one and done. You never think about them again, or if you do think about them again, you're like, uh, no problem, no residue, nothing. But it's not always like a whiteboard. <laughs> and kind of ironically that when I was preparing this message and to preparing to talk a bit about forgiveness, I found some of those names that I'd forgiven like a week ago coming back to the surface and with them some of the residue started coming back to the surface. And so for some of them, this act of forgiveness wasn't a whiteboard. In fact, it looks and feels more like a garden where the same weeds keep popping up. And if and when they do, forgive 
again and again and again. Continue to guide your heart. Second practice that's very accessible is celebration. So here's a question. What's your default reaction when you come across somebody who's doing better in a certain area of life than you are? You know, maybe they have a healthier marriage than you or a nicer house than you or better abs than you. What's your, what's your default reaction? What, what, just, what, what, what genuinely happens on the inside, even if you don't say it? Is it, worst case scenario, you doing an internal eye roll, oh, must be nice, fueled by cynicism and jealousy and envy? This will corrode your heart. There was this incredible exchange that Jesus had when he came back from the dead and appeared again to his chosen followers, one of whom was Peter. And in fact, last uh, week, uh, Jacob, one of our teaching team, did an incredible message on uh, some of this experience that Peter had with Jesus. It was called Walking with Jesus. Go back and watch that or listen to it on our podcast. But uh, Jesus, when he reappeared to his disciples, one of the things he started doing was he started telling Peter, like predicting that Peter was a pretty like soon-ish going to die. And, and the death is gonna, was going to happen sooner than he expected. Uh, it was going to be more brutal than he expected, which, you know, if you're Peter, you're hearing this, it's like, it, it's a lot to process. And so we read that Peter's kind of processing this. And as he's doing that, he looks over his shoulder and he sees John, one of the other disciples of Jesus. And he said to Jesus, okay, uh, all right, I'm going to die. It's going to be sooner than I want. It's going to be more brutal than I, I want. But what about him? I mean, if I've got to go through this struggle, Surely someone else should go through it as well. I mean, it's not fair if it's only me. And Jesus clapped back, Peter, if I want him, John, to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. Like, don't compare yourself and your calling to other people. Just do what I've called you to to do. My calling to you is your benchmark, not somebody else's anything. And so when God is doing something good in someone else's life, why would we get jealous? What is it to you? And by the way, you might be next. In fact, one of life's great truths is that when we lift other people up, and celebrate what God's doing in them, for them, through them. When we lift them up and celebrate that, actually God has an incredible way of lifting us up as well. So, accessible practice number one, forgiveness. And I'm saying accessible. I'm not saying easy, but I am saying accessible. It's doable. Accessible practice number two, to guard your heart, celebrate. Celebrate God's good works in and for and through other people. And the third one is generosity. Tim Keller, who led a church in Manhattan, in downtown New York City for 40 years, uh, was talking about that over these 40 years, he had countless people in the church come to him to want to confess uh, a sin, something that they've done and ask him to pray for them. And, and he said, you know, like, I, I, heard, I, I heard it all. Every sin that you could possibly imagine at some point in those 40 years, somebody confessed that to me except for one. He said, never once in 40 years did I have someone come to me and say, Tim, you know what? 
I'm greedy. <laughs> I'm struggling with greed. Please pray for me. Which ironically is in like the epicenter of uh, one of the epicenters of capitalism on the planet. But nevertheless, it, I've never had someone confess it to me. And I wonder if you've ever confessed it yourself. Because the reality is we live in a culture of more, wanting more, getting more, and then finding that that's not enough. And so we want more and we get more. And because it's so normal in our prevailing culture, we kind of overlook the fact that it might actually be corroding our heart. We, we, we kind of don't see it in ourselves a lot of the time. I, I mean, that's the peculiar thing about selfishness and greed. We very readily recognize it in other people. Oh, they're so selfish. Oh my God, that's, they're so greedy. And, and yet, mm. and so Jesus spoke specifically to this. He said, beware, God, there's that word again, against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own which throwing that statement out into our current prevailing culture sounds old fashioned. It sounds back to front. It sounds confused. It sounds unrealistic because our prevailing culture measures us precisely by how much we own, measures our worth, our value, our standing, our status by things like our financial portfolio. Uh, which suburb you live in and, and how many square meters your home is, uh, by the car you drive or the clothing labels you wear or what school your kids go to. But kingdom culture doesn't measure our lives by those same metrics. Now, Jesus' warning isn't against having some nice stuff. His warning, however, is against nice stuff having us, about nice things in the pursuit of more and what we own, when that becomes the priority of our hearts, then our hearts will lead us in a different direction than the one that Jesus is calling us to. If we ever start placing the pursuit of stuff <coughs> ahead of the pursuit of God and His purposes, in and through our life, then we're off base right there. So the best way I know to guard your heart against greed is generosity. Generosity is the antidote to greed, to consistently and faithfully prioritize your time, the talents, and your treasure for the plans and purposes of God. Your time, get your calendar for the week, for the month, and first lock in the kingdom stuff and then lock in the other stuff. Take your personal energy budget. You know, we, we, we all burn 24 hours a day. We all burn 168 hours a week and you can't do everything. Make sure that you give energy, not leftover energy, as a priority to the things that God's called you to do. And then finances, which is the one that probably gets a lot of the airtime in this idea of generosity. And it matters that we would be people who prioritize God's kingdom ahead of using the money that God blesses us with. Firstly, for the accumulation and the acquisition of more stuff. Now, Final thing is, uh, if you weren't aware, every week we, uh, in the Bible app, we publish a featured plan in the My Church section. Now you can access that, scan this QR code. It'll take you to the My Church section of the Bible app. You can set Elevate Church as My Church. And then every Monday we post a featured Bible reading plan that follows on and speaks directly to the topic that we've taught that particular week. So literally... Uh, we will be less than 24 hours away from publishing this week's featured plan, which will be all about 
studying how we can best guard our heart. So get on that. It's free. And、uh, I do it. Our team does it. It's, it's just a great, great, great practice as we continue to fight the good fight. We'll see you next week.